You're fired. The Harrier jump jet, a symbol of British engineering pride, easily recognizable for its distinct shape, and most importantly for doing something almost no other fixed-wing aircraft can do, hover. This is an iconic aircraft that has a legendary appearance in pop culture, from movies to video games, and a remarkable record in actual combat. The most famous appearance of the Harrier in pop culture is no doubt the True Lies movie, which offers some incredible scenes featuring the aircraft. For most scenes, the movie uses a 47-foot mock-up Harrier, which was placed on top of a 20-story building. The scenes are overall fantastic, but do stray from reality. The movie exaggerates capable hover time, as well as the amount of ammunition the cannon has. It further ignores how incredibly deafening the engine can be, but a great film nonetheless. So as always, let's highlight the real history and use of the Harrier while showcasing some pop culture appearances. The Harrier was the only successful vertical landing and takeoff jet plane in the West until the F-35B Lightning II Joint Strike Fighter, which was introduced in 2008. Though it should be noted the F-35B is typically referred to as a short takeoff and vertical landing aircraft, as vertical takeoffs stress the airframe and limit the weight of the payload during takeoff. This is also how the Harrier typically takes off for the same reasons. The Harrier's abilities required many special features. Auxiliary air doors allowed the engines to take in extra air during hover, compensating for a lack of forward movement that would normally bring air into the engine. The nozzles, of course, are the most interesting feature. Four large rotating nozzles, two on each side, direct the thrust of the aircraft. For vertical takeoff, the nozzles point straight down. As the aircraft lifts off, the nozzles rotate to the horizontal for forward flight. To get off the ground, a 15,000-pound Harrier will blast 24,000 pounds of thrust from these nozzles, generating immense heat. To land, the process is reversed and the aircraft can be quickly brought to a standstill. Once the Harrier is in hover mode, the aircraft's wings no longer provide any lift, and the aircraft relies only on the thrust of the engine pointing directly down. To help give control while in hover, the aircraft has small puffer ducts on the wingtips, the nose, and the tail. During hover, the engine is at full power and burning rapidly through fuel. To stop the engine from overheating, water is injected into the engine. 500 pounds of water is available for cooling. This allows for a sustained hover of around 90 seconds. The aircraft can hover for longer depending on its load and the air temperature. In the movies, long hover action scenes are not realistic, nor is hovering for the purpose of ambush. These engines would have long overheated. Hovering is primarily used for landing. Only a small fraction of takeoffs use hovering. A Harrier's ability to land vertically allows it to operate close to front lines, almost anywhere there's a roadway or parking lot. This versatile landing ability has famously saved a few pilots. In one situation, a U.S. Marine Harrier had a malfunction with its nose landing gear. To land safely, the aircraft was slowly brought down to land its nose on a special stool, a testament to both the aircraft and the highly skilled pilots chosen to fly them. The most famous situation where vertical landing saved a pilot was when a British Royal Navy Sea Harrier became lost from its carrier. Short on fuel, the pilot was able to locate a Spanish container ship to safely land on. The pilot was uninjured and the jet was recovered. The event received widespread media coverage. It was both an embarrassment for the Navy, but also a triumph for the plane and pilot, who sadly was reprimanded. Um, I lost navigation equipment trying to find my way back to the ship and therefore became lost and uncertain of position. Uh, trying to call them on the radio, I had no success. 
and therefore set up a search trying to find the ship. Uh, as the fuel was getting low, I realised it was futile and uh, picked this ship out of the only one around. There were no other no, ships available? Nothing else, no. And how much fuel did you have left? I have uh, maybe one minute, one minute's flying. That's when you got to this ship? Yeah. The Harrier, of course, is a British design, developed by British manufacturer Hawker Sidley in the 1960s. But the largest fleet of Harriers belonged to the U.S. Marines. Second-generation Harriers would also be jointly upgraded by American aviation manufacturer McDonnell Douglas. The aircraft has further been flown by Spain, Italy, Thailand, and India. The British design was an amazing feat of engineering. The quest to have aircraft take off from short runways had been struggled with for decades. In World War II, Germany experimented with strapping rockets to aircraft to help them take off on shorter runways. This was copied by the Americans. After World War II, there was emphasis placed on developing aircraft that could take off even if their runways were destroyed. This was due to the fear of mass destruction that would come from a nuclear war. Many interesting VTOL prototypes came before the Harrier. Aircraft that took off and landed with the tail facing down were dangerous for the pilot trying to land with his back to the ground. The Bell X-14 was the first aircraft that deflected thrust downwards, but it was too underpowered. The Hummingbird had a giant lift system, but it was too big to be practical, taking up the entire fuselage. The British started with the flying bedstead, which showed promise in that it was maneuverable, though it certainly wasn't much else. Another British design was the short SC-1. This had five engines, four for vertical lift and one for forward flight. Too heavy to be practical. The French produced the Balsac with nine engines. It had two fatal crashes and was abandoned. Eventually a French engineer, Michel Wibaud, drafted a one-engine design using four centrifugal compressors mounted on the sides of an airframe around the center of gravity. The compressor outlet nozzles were able to swivel, but as an independent engineer, his design didn't get much attention until English engineer Gordon Lewis discovered his complicated design, which would help inspire the movable nozzle system for the Harrier. The first Harrier design used a new powerful Pegasus engine. It took some time to perfect and frequently caught fire. The first prototype was unstable, overweight, and underpowered, but showed a promising start. Test pilots needed incredible skill. The aircraft needed to be pointed precisely into the wind during transition and could easily roll. But the potential for a great aircraft was there. Engineers overcame the problems and pilots began learning to better handle an entirely new breed of aircraft. And they're off. 2.3 litre, 250 horsepower turbo against 21,500 pounds of jet thrust. Harry is off the ground and already doing 200 miles an hour. Despite success, the aircraft was not immediately adopted in large numbers. The biggest downside to the Harrier is that it can't fly supersonic, therefore can't intercept most Soviet aircraft. The British adopted the aircraft in limited numbers in 1969, with the U.S. Marines buying the aircraft in 1971. The aircraft was to be a close air support aircraft as part of NATO defense at the height of the Cold War. The Soviets had their own VTOL aircraft during the Cold War. 231 Yak-38s were built, and like the Harrier, they could operate from carriers. But despite the production numbers, they were poor aircraft. They were poorly equipped and unsafe. Around 40 were lost to accidents. The Harrier became more valuable to Britain in the 1970s due to budget cuts within the military. The British could no longer afford massive carriers designed for typical fighter jets. The Harrier gave the Royal Navy an opportunity to build new smaller and most importantly affordable carriers that could be armed with the Harrier. The Sea Harrier introduced in 1978 was developed specifically for the Invincible class carrier and would end up front and center in an unexpected war. I will not negotiate with criminals or thugs. 
The Falkland Islands belong to Britain, and I want them back. In 1982, Argentina invaded the Falkland Islands. The Harrier was essential to the task force, destined to take them back. Just 28 Harriers faced over 100 Argentinian aircraft, including supersonic Mirage fighters. As soon as the task force arrived near the islands, Harriers began downing enemy aircraft. The Harriers were kept busy during the invasion. The Argentinian Air Force continuously engaged the task force. Altogether, the British lost seven vessels. However, Harriers protected the majority of the task force and shot down a total of 20 aircraft and supported troops on the ground. Not a single Harrier was lost in air-to-air -air combat. Though credit can be attributed to the Harrier, pilot skill and tactics played a huge role in their success. Adding to the aircraft's lethality was the use of advanced Sidewinder missiles. The Harrier saw further action in northern Iraq, Kosovo, and Bosnia. The aircraft was able to keep relevant in modern times. The Harrier II's fuselage was upgraded using modern light composite materials. Modern Harriers retained the Pegasus engine, but the engine was upgraded over its lifetime, eventually giving out twice the power as the original design. The Harrier II has a maximum speed of Mach 0.9, a combat range of 300 nautical miles. It has one rotary cannon with 300 rounds about enough for a five-second burst. It can hold up to 9,200 pounds, or 4,200 kilograms, of bombs or missiles. The British no longer fly the Harrier. The Marine Corps, however, currently retains over 100 second-generation Harriers, but is transitioning to the F-35 platform. The Harrier's greatest downsides are its speed, range, and safety record. It requires very skilled pilots to fly. But despite this, the Harrier did something many modern jet fighters never did, which was prove itself in combat, and even more rare, the life and death protection of a fleet under attack. The Harrier is one of the most equally radical and successful designs ever flown by any military. Alright, I'm Johnny. Thanks for hovering around until the end of the video. I hope you have a nice rest of your day, and we'll see you in the next one.